in your book, you differentiate between Kaizen or continuous improvement and Tozen or correction of a process. Would you mind to talk about that a little bit? You go ahead, Matt. That's right. So, you know, as, as you said in the introduction, yeah, between Eric and myself, we've got, you know, over 60 years of experience doing this. And, and yes, yeah, what the last number of years we were noodling on this book and how to how do we highlight this issue so you know the and really the core of it is this toes end concept of just seeing repeated you know examples of this at different companies that we worked in and and worked at where you know learning from things that we're doing in the current operations whether it's you know in in a service industry or even just you know ma traditional manufacturing the next generation product comes along or service and we, we forgot all those things that we took out to make improvements and then we end up almost doing the same thing over and over again. We, we've seen it over and over again where uh, in comes the new process, the new line, the new, the new way of doing things and it's often felt like a step back. Uh, in, in fact, we, we personally experienced that as uh, folks working in the continuous improvement space of we, we're going and doing a lot of great improvement in a particular area and the new line comes in and the next thing you know, we have to set everything down and go fix the new line just to get it up to speed to what we're already at in, in, the, in the plant. And, and so, you know, it's just like a real classic example and it happens over and over again. I see it in a lot of, a lot of manufacturers these days and in a lot of other processes too that uh, just get implemented and it's like people feel like it's a step backwards and, and it often is because the thinking wasn't done up front to build this stuff into the actual process design. And there will always, let's, let's be clear, there will always be continuous improvement. That, that doesn't ever go away. It's just we can do better up front. I see. Okay. So why don't manufacturers focus more on lean within process development? One of the things is that uh, it, it's actually kind of interesting. If you go back to uh, the original book that the, uh, the term lean was coined in, the machine that changed the world, which, you know, usually when I ask a large group these days, there might be one person in there who's read it. And most people were born after it was written. But in, in that book, there are chapters on lean in the development space and lean in the business side of things and lean in the supply chain. But it's almost as though everybody read the lean in manufacturing part. And then that's where, where the, the, the thinking has been all these years. I think another aspect is one fundamental thing is it's easier to improve processes that you can see like right now. And when, as you move upstream, a lot of this is knowledge work. Um, uh, in our book, it, it is kind of in that spot where it's going from knowledge work to starting to make some physical mock-ups and then eventually the actual process. But uh, it's harder to do improvement in that space just because it's you, you don't have as much tangible to see. Whereas out on the factory floor or in the emergency room or in the warehouse, you can see something. And so it's a lot easier to see problems, issues, opportunities and, and do improvement. Yeah, and I can add, Jennifer, that I think there's also this dimension of what we call the development death spiral. That, that's what a term, a term that Jim Morgan, who we, we work with at LEI, uh, taught us basically was this development death spiral. And what, what is meant by that is you become almost so consumed by trying to fix the current one that's getting ready to launch that you don't have enough time to move upstream to start designing and thinking about the next one that's... Uh, being designed. So decisions are being made uh, in absence of the right people being together to think through. And uh, so that's that's a part of it as well. Sometimes people are just too fixy doing rework on what's being launched right now that, you know, you can't think a year ahead or two years ahead. And uh, so even if you have the right process, the people may not be available. And so, so it's hard sometimes to carve out time to get out of that death spiral as well. It's never too late to start. So I, I wouldn't say, uh, and if, if that's the case, meaning like, let's say you don't have time to do the first three, the context, concepts, converge, you're basically getting ready to qualify a, a system. You could start there at the fourth con, for example. So the point is, you know, it's never too late to start, but it's better, you know, to start these upstream in the context phase uh, and do these things as early as possible because you'll minimize the risk. And, and again, I just want to make a key point too, is that, you know, in the book, it's, 
we take a real life example that we experienced and we've normalized it to you know protect sensitive data but it's a 10x payback um, doing this right the the team you know with six hundred thousand dollar investment gets around six million dollar payback over a 10-year period so it's it's not we're not just doing this to um, you know minimize rework uh, you know doing that it's also being able to not spend capital on things we don't need to um, have high quality you know safety all those great things is ideally you start you start at the beginning but what I would I would advise anybody whatever makes the most sense for getting started now because even if you start at the tail and you can learn some things uh, that you can then carry on to the next one and start at the beginning so it's a situational it depends I guess basically case to case I think that's a, a way of putting it. Um, and, and you know that when you get into a lot of the lean tools and concepts and lean approaches out there, they are all very, you know, tend to be very situational. Um, and, uh, and they all are really highly dependent on someone's current state. You know, a lot of, a lot of the tools out there, step one is understanding the current state before you start just randomly applying things. You know, uh, I've seen plenty of uh, processes that uh, might have really good equipment, but because we hadn't thought about how the operator interfaces with it, how the work is balanced, uh, how material gets in and out, how material gets reordered in, into the area and all that, that can that can sink a whole process right there. And so even, even though there might be in this particular case I'm describing, you know, capital equipment committed and installed, that doesn't mean they can't start. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, is there anything that you would like to add to the conversation um, before we close today? So the, the one thing I would add at this point is, and we maybe we've alluded to this a little bit already, but is to pick something and get started. Uh, that, that's probably the most, uh, you know, most important and, uh, uh, piece of advice we, we, I think we could give right now is, is uh, you know, um, don't spend a lot of time theoretically talking about this stuff and debating it and, st and so on. Um, it's, you know, pick a project and get started. If it's one that's in flight and you're not going to have another one coming for, uh, you know, a time period, okay. You know, figure out where you are in the development cycle and, and, and go from there. Uh, if it's something that's, hey, you just happen to be fortunate enough and it's a, it's a new process, you know, there's a, a product being developed, um, maybe there's an opportunity to let, let's go ahead and apply this right now and, and, and uh, try it. Um, a second thing, and then I'll pause so Matt can maybe get a, get some, some words in here. But a second thing is one nuance of the book is it actually follows kind of two stories. The one story is the, the working team working on great process development. Okay. The second story is of the leadership team and their interaction with the working team and how they support this new way of doing work and how do you propagate it. So that would probably be a second thing is when you go to this, make sure to do some reflection on how it's working for you because this shouldn't just be a one-off thing. You should be thinking about how do you actually institutionalize this as a way of doing process development in the organization. Not just, you know, we're going to have this one-time team do this. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Eric, because we were fortunate to be in an organization that was about a $30 billion revenue organization that was able to do this, that second part of um, spreading it, cascading it, and then actually improving it. And that's very difficult to do in large organizations. You know, I'm not saying it's easy to do a one-off, uh, you know, great process development activity, but it's, it's not... Um, it's not easy, but it's it's not as difficult as doing it and then spreading it across you know a large multinational organization. And the other piece I would just say too is to get started also is a good thing to do is just reflect on you know if you did recently just develop a new process. Again, it doesn't need to be manufacturing; it could be healthcare, it could be the service industry. But to basically kind of study it, learn from it, document what happened, and uh, you know what decisions were made um, to do that's a great place to start to get the team to align around. Okay, we did this, and this is what the result was because we don't want to recreate that or um, follow that same path. And 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 you know, in manufacturing, to develop a manufacturing process or a new process for a new product can take years in some cases, and we forget what 
decisions we made six months ago or a year ago or you know if if you showed me an email that I sent two years ago I would I couldn't tell you if I actually sent that or not right let alone a you know key decision related to a product or a process so we forget the decisions that we made and the impacts that it, that it, they have if we're not reflecting back so that's a very important um, part of uh, of the learning too is we got to think back of what we did what were the consequences how do we avoid those going forward okay all right well i really appreciate your time today it was an honor cool thanks, thanks jennifer yeah thanks for having we us appreciate it thank you for more insights on assembling discrete parts into finished products and the people behind it all visit our website assemblymag.com and be sure to subscribe to the podcast to keep up with our latest episodes. We're also on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, so we invite you to follow us there too. This has been Assembly Audible. Thanks for listening.